three of our church family friends, the Roman Catholics, the Episcopalians, and the Lutherans, practice Advent in a very specific way. And what they do is they're not allowed to have Christmas carols until Christmas Eve. So you don't sing a little town of Bethlehem. You don't have a choir cantata on Christmas before Christmas Eve. And so it's a time of meditation, fasting, and then you celebrate. And then you get the 12 days of Christmas. That's where that comes from. And on the uh, 12th day, you're giving gifts all those days. On the 12th day, then, that's the, uh, the coming of the wise men, the epiphany. And so then they celebrate that. So not me. I, I, was, I just like to celebrate Christmas all during Advent. And I look to the true meaning of Christmas, uh, the coming of Christmas, by going into the Christmas carols and into the Christmas themes. So, but some of my uh, Presbyterian uh, minister friends, about half go with the, um, the uh, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Roman Catholic tradition. And, uh, but I did talk to my friend over in Mount Vernon when Reverend Rob Dyer was there. He said, no way, he's doing Christmas carols. So I was happy to hear, hear that. Now he's moved on to Belleville. Now, what I want to share about the epiphany is that the wise men are coming. They are astrologers from Persia. And they would study the night sky. And it's amazing how much they knew about the night sky. It's just, they really had it down. And they believed in the zodiac. Fire, do you ever look up your, um, what your future is in the zodiac thing? You know, you look up and say something, you know. Well, there's a wonderful line in Shakespeare in the play Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar is taking on power and kingship doing away with the democracy, doing away with the republic, and he's taking the power. And Brutus and another conspirator who are going to assassinate him, you know, he says, beware the Ides of March, that means the middle of March, watch out, you know, Julius. What happens here is that they're talking and they're saying, one says to the other, the fault lies not in the stars that we grovel at Julius Caesar's feet. <laughs> the fault lies where? Shakespeare says, within us. So we look to what's in us as to how to create our lives. And Jesus gives us a very important gift. Now when the astrologers come, they bring the symbolic gifts, gold. You don't walk into the king's presence without gold. Frankincense, that would show that um, he would be priest. And then myrrh, very expensive for, for burial, that he would die. Now, what I like about this, they came and they had the privilege of meeting the new king. And they were so touched by this. And they gave their gifts. But I love how the scriptures say, they returned by a different way. And here's my coaching for this year. You know, it's New Year's resolutions, even though we are on kind of kind of late here so far. Could we live by a different way, a different priority, because we've been to Christ, because we worship the Christ, the King? You know, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Now, what I look at is, are we going to receive receive the light that Jesus offers us, the salvation, the light, the joy, and he gives us certain spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts are found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Here is the true gold that we're to ask for. Now, years ago, I would think, Lord, send me peace. But I wasn't very loving. I wasn't going to get peace. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Very first thing. Then comes the joy. When you start practicing love, loving yourself and loving others, loving God, then comes the joy. So let love take root. John chapter 13, Jesus says, his de definition of you're a disciple is you're loving the others in the church family. And some of us are difficult to love. We're just difficult. And so 
It means you had to choose to love. Which we'll get to our point pretty soon here. It's a choosing to love. But what happens if I choose to love? Bad things are going to happen to me. No. Joy. Love, joy, peace. Then patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness. And here's the New Year's resolution. The gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of Jesus' Spirit, self-control. Self-control. Now, what I mean by this is that self-control is a sign of emotional maturity. It's a sign that we're not just a reaction machine. It's a sign that you have a choice. If you believe in free will, choosing, then you can exercise self-control. I'm going to give an example of this. Uh, my mom, being the best therapist I ever knew, uh, maybe your mom was or grandma was, that little Eddie, and I'm being naughty, ready to tell off and fight with my brother and sisters, um, count to ten before you respond. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I mean, you know, the idea is to put a little bit of a gap between my irritation and my response. Now, so I would go, I should be going, one, two, three. Have any of you ever played a game called poker? You know, if you had four aces, you don't want to show it off. You have to be able to have some self-control. Or if you had nothing in your hand and you're bluffing, you want to have, show some self-control. But you're counting four, five, six. And this happened to my grandson. This happened a couple of years ago. He's coming home from school, and my grandson uh, was from Ethiopia. He has some rooted problems. He was, a, he was a street kid. No food some days. You heard about the Ethiopian situation. And so there's issues of anger up here. And maybe behind the anger, maybe fear. And he sees a therapist in Indianapolis. Anyway, he's coming home, and he's ready to tell his mother off. Now, when people tell somebody else off, they're always looking for a safe target. So mom is often the target. If you're, going, you're not going to tell the policeman off, or you don't want to tell the principal of the school off. Uh, you find a safe target. So if you've ever been selected, you actually are diverting somebody's energy and stuff. So he's ready to explode as he comes in the door to mom. And he's ready to go at it. And his mom already taught him the count of ten. Count to ten. That shocks him. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh. Sorry, mom, I apologize. Went down to play. But the point is you're trying to get a little bit of space between what happens and then how we react. And it, my son's a psychologist, and he had a big advantage of other kids because he could see all the craziness in his father. And, and by the way, our family had a lot of different kind of issues with our relatives. My, my son could look at one of my uh, brother's families and say, well, this one has this, this one has this, this one has this, this one has this. Dad was alcoholic, so he was a doctor, but alcoholic, and there was a lot of pain, and he could just track out the outcomes. So the, the point here now is, could I not just react? Could I think, what is the kind thing to do? What's the compassionate thing to do before I respond? And that gap is self-control. And my request for myself, my suggestion for, for all of us would be, let's look at the spiritual gift of self-control. It's a gift. Jesus gives us power. He gives us power, dynamo, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Power, agape, is a choosing love. And finally, sound thinking. You're not a doormat, you sound thinking. So, here's the point now, again. Jesus comes and gives us love. First of all, are we receiving the Christmas gift of love? We really get it. 
Now, when I was a kid, I sang, um, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Then the chorus, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. It's all in my head here. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. It's head. And we really need to be down in the Bible class at 9.30. Get more head knowledge. The second step now from Bible knowledge is that it needs to move. As a kid, Jesus loves me, but unless it moves to my heart, oh, I'm loved. As we take Holy Communion, oh, I'm loved. When you take the bread, Jesus loves me and is giving me the gift of spiritual strength to follow him. Not to carry a resentment or to pick the resentment up in the morning. To pick it up again. No, let it go. Jesus doesn't want us to carry resentments or hurts or regrets. Let it go. He gives us the spiritual strength. And then the cup, well, he held that cup up for his disciples. They had no idea what it meant. This cup is a new agreement between God and all humanity, me, you, for the forgiveness of every sin. My past, I could let it go. You can learn from it. There might be consequences to some of the things I did, but spiritually it's not here. And I'm not to fear the future because Jesus' love washes over me and the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear say, of the future. In the present moment, I'm loved. And so when you take Holy Communion, just get that you're loved. And let the love come from the mind, come to the heart. And as we grow spiritually, let's practice the spiritual gift. The way to love ourselves is to have that self-control, to practice it. I might forget sometimes and say, oh, next time I'll do it. But there is a, a wonderful uh, spiritual master who said this. The one who is reviled. Have you ever been reviled? Somebody told you up and down. If you've been in the military and the, and the sergeant got you, uh, my son was in uh, boot camp, where those sergeants can lay right into you, right? And um, when you're reviled, the one who is one reviled and reviles not again. So you're receiving some bad stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. But you're not reviled back. In other words, you're not passing it back again. You're able to have some self control. So I don't pass it back. They just needed a place to dump. A twofold victory wins. For he seeks the good. Why would it be two victory? He seeks the good of the other. It's better for that other person that I don't respond. And it's better for myself. Because they might be the greatest words I ever speak in anger <laughs> that I regret. <laughs> so it's good for me, too, not to go down that road. To remain calm, peaceful, no matter the outer turbulence, because Jesus' spiritual gift of love is already inside of us. It's just already given. It's just that we cover it up. I cover it up with my resentments, my hurts, and it doesn't shine. Just let it out. And if you have trouble with it, just say, Jesus, please help me. Four words is all we need. Jesus, please help me. Our closing hymn was a Christmas carol written in the Appalachian Mountains. And a person came along and listened to it and wrote it down. He got the credit for it, but he couldn't find where it came from. But we're going to sing the first and last verses. But it talks about these people um, in the hills of mountains of Kentucky and Tennessee and West Virginia. There is a faith there 
that gave him hope. And that hope for us is Jesus and his love that moves from our head to our hearts. Amen.